All right. Well, we will be in Hebrews chapter 4. We made it. Look at all the doubters now. Did anybody have questions about Hebrews that either you read on your own or from something we just we talked about here on Wednesday? Going once, going twice. Okay, you lost your chance. Got to wait another week now. Um, we're going to read through it first, and we'll kind of go through and, and 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 break it down. So last week, uh, the pretty much the theme of the section we're looking at could just be summarized by saying, "Keep a watch on your lifestyle." So now we go into chapter four, and he goes on with this. Therefore, since the promise to enter his rest remains, let us beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. For we also have received the good news just as they did but the message they heard did not benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith for we who have believed enter the rest in keeping with what he said so i swore in my anger they will not enter my rest even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the of the world for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way and on the seventh day god rested from all his works Again, in that passage, he says, they will never enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter because of disobedience, he again specifies a certain day, today. He specified this speaking through David after such a long time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. So I, I want to preface everything that we're going to say tonight by typically there's some people who are paranoid that they're going to accidentally not be saved. So so typically there's going to be some sorts of signs or something. You know, it's not just going to be like, oh, no, i not a Christian. I didn't even know it. Um, you know, there's going to be like a sin that the Holy Spirit was convicting you of. It's not like you have to um, live in constant fear. Obviously, the Bible tells us, you know, to... To consider with fear and trembling, you know, you know, yes, there should be a point when you have a serious, <laughs> serious, you know, soul search or whatever. Am I, am I saved? But I'm assuming at this point that, you know, everybody here has done that. I mean, you guys have been Christians for a while, so I'm assuming you've done that uh, at a much earlier point. And the point of Hebrews is not to be afraid that you're going to, you know, oh, let's constantly live in fear that I might have accidentally lost my salvation. Um, the point of Hebrews is more talking about Christians who know what they're doing. They're allowing sin in their life. So if you are in that point, then you would know it, probably, I'm guessing. <laughs> I'm assuming the Holy Spirit is active in your life, so yes, you would know. Uh, it's not like something you can accidentally lose your salvation, okay? So um, there's three points in verse 4 that I think I want to kind of point out. Um, uh, first off, he says, therefore, that's connecting it to what we were looking at last week, where it says, hey, we are participants if we hold firm. So with that, mi- with that in mind, therefore, since with that in- thing in mind, let's obey. Since the promise to enter his rest still remains, let us beware. Um, the second word I kind of want to zone in on is the word beware. Um, in the NIV, it doesn't really come across, I think, strongly enough. Um, it has more of a... Uh, does anybody have an NIV? Yes, let us be careful. That's how the NIV words it. Um, I really like the NIV. However, I think that this, they didn't quite get this word. The idea is more like, let us be afraid. Le, le, kind of like a, a reverent, uh, I wrote it down here, a reverent reflection, not simple caution. We're talking about uh, much more serious than that. Beware, take great alert <laughs> that none of you uh, be found to have fallen short. Um, obviously, when you're in sin as a Christian for a while, you kind of get numb to it, and then you kind of start to accept it as a part of, oh, this is just how we do things. And you can definitely get into that, into that place. But once again, this is a process where you are becoming hardened over years, not something where you accidentally like woke up and you weren't saved one day. You know, it's not, it's not like that. So um, and you can kind of hear the author of Hebrews saying it's something like this, if I could use my own words. Their disobedience led to unbelief. We... The Hebrews should watch out too. Uh, so then, the third, the third uh, section word, I guess you want, you could say that I want to focus on is fallen short. Um, it, it, beware that none of you be found to have fallen short. And the idea here is not messing up. He's not talking about beware that none of you have ever sinned. No, you're, you're going to sin. You're going to mess up. That's not what he's talking about. Um, fallen short, especially in the context of Hebrews, is more than messing up. It's about, especially if you remember the context. 
He's been talking about how the people of Israel were disobeying, and that lead to, led to their unbelief, right? And so, obviously, what he's talking about here by falling short, he's talking about having faith without obedience. And there's, there's a lot of times that, that I talk to people who do this, like, oh, I, I, I've, I've got this faith, they say, because they've got a feeling. You know, I've got this, this warm, fuzzy feeling in here. And so because I've got that feeling, that means I'm saved. You know, God's, and me and God have a special agreement. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can live however I want, but at the end of the day, we're, we're good with each other, you know. Um, actually, there was a man who was living in Seneca weeks ago uh, who, <laughs> this was basically his premise of the argument. I can, it's okay that I live in this sin, uh, because, you know, me and God have this have this agreement. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to change my lifestyle. We, me and God are good. It's like, well, <laughs> you say that, <laughs> but uh, and obviously that's kind of the, kind of exactly what what is talk, being talked about here. Faith without obedience, where I can obey, I can I can believe in God, but kind of on my own terms. Um, so faith, faith is not something that you feel. Uh, people in our culture really emphasize feelings over everything. Like over everything, logic or really anything, and so a lot of times when we go to the Bible, we inadvertently translate it in our heads a certain way. So it'll say faith or something, and we think, okay, that's that feeling that I get where I'm firm of something. Well, not not really. In the Bible, faith more often than not has something to do with uh, an action or a lifestyle or something besides just some feeling you get in your... I mean, you guys have been saved a while. You know that you don't always feel like, hooray, I'm a Christian, right? You wake up some days and you're like, <sighs> another day. You know what I mean? You, you have those days. It happens. You're, you're a person. Um, and, and obviously, um, so faith is something more than that. <clears throat> so that none of you be found to have fallen short because these people, they disobeyed and that's how they fell short. They were living in disobedience, led to their unbelief. They fell short. Let's make sure that we don't do that. So you get to verse 2. And uh, it says, where is somewhere over here? There it is. Uh, For we also have received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard did not benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. So um, it's kind of important to kind of look at a few things here. First off, he says, we have received as they did, the good news just as they did. And uh, one of the biggest, I think, misunderstandings about the law is that the people in the Old Testament got saved by different means than we get saved today. And that's not true. Um, the people in the Old Testament, they looked forward in faith to the coming Christ, and we look backwards in faith to the coming Christ. But salvation is still through faith in God. Before and after, it's still the same. The sacrifices never never brought what was needed. And we're going to look at that later in Hebrews. Hebrews talks about this. The sacrifices didn't... <laughs> if the sacrifices could have done that, Jesus wasn't necessary. And so, obviously, the sacrifices didn't do that. Um, so, okay, Absolutely. Uh, Jesus did something that the sacrifices never did. So, but with that being said, a lot of times people still get this idea that, okay, so we've received good news, and that means, let me, let me, try, let me try and say this in a different way. God can't in good conscience, that's a good way of saying it, God cannot in good conscience bring condemnation on the people of the Old Testament because Jesus had not been revealed. Whereas he can bring judgment on us because Jesus has been revealed. And that's not accurate. Um, they chose to have faith or chose not to have faith. We choose the exact same thing. Abraham was saved by faith. Noah was saved by faith. We are saved by faith. And once again, it's not, it's not faith in our faith. Like if I work myself up, up into, into a firmness, Faith in this, in this idea is more of a um, stead, steadfast acceptance of, of God, trusting him for our salvation, okay? It's not, it's not about feelings. It's about a decision. It's about, you know, that, that kind of stuff. So let's, let's, move, let's move on from here and look at this next part where it says, but the message they heard did not benefit them. Obviously, he's kind of trying to imply something with his audience here. It didn't benefit them since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. So not everybody made it to the promise end, uh, Basically, so we see from this we see two very important points. First off, we see that hearing is not the same as believing. Hearing something is not the same as believing it. The second important point that we that we can get from this verse is that knowing something is not the same as believing it. Knowing something and hearing something is not the same as believing something. So hearing something is just Somebody hears 
the good news of Jesus Christ, okay? But there still has to be a decision that's made. Uh, knowing something is okay, so salvation is through Jesus. But do you believe, though? There's a point where you have to cross a line and say, okay, I believe for that thing. And, uh, I mean, we even see this with Satan. I mean, he, he knows, but he's not saved, right? So there's, there's definitely a line in the sand there uh, between what we do know, what we, what we hear, and what we believe. Uh, so if we hop forward to verse 6, it says this, Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news do not enter because of disobedience. So some are going to enter it, and some are not going to enter it. Um, and the idea here, I think, um, that, that really speaks volumes is that we don't get to live life on our own special terms. We don't get to live on our, on our own basis. We don't have a special relationship with God. <laughs> He doesn't like, oh, well, I, I'm the favorite, so I get to do things that he told me that I can't do. And uh, uh, there has to be a point where we make a choice. And just like when you start to get into a sin, and you guys know what I'm talking about. You've been saved long enough. You start getting into a sin. It's not a big deal at first, and then you do it more, and then it starts, okay, I think that maybe this is a big deal, and then God's really convicting you, and then you still keep doing it. And then eventually the conviction stops, and okay, we're, we're good, because <laughs> the Holy Spirit finally backed off, so it's good now. No, it's just... <laughs> You're in a bad place now. And you guys know, I mean, you've been saved long enough. Uh, when you've sa- been saved five years, it, but when you've been saved, you know, 15, 20 years, it's nothing new to you. You know what I mean? And so sometimes you kind of back off a little bit. Maybe you don't read the Bible as much as you did. You're not so enthusiastic about the whole Christian thing as you were. I mean, it happens. And uh, uh, we just kind of get in those places. And I think one of the important things that we always keep alive in our Christian walk is that we continue to approach and seek God with humility and not pride. I find the older I am in Christ, the easier pride seems to come. When I first got saved, I mean, I kind of knew that I was a mess. You know what I mean? But then over time, you kind of like, oh, no, I'm saved. I, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I got my act together. So, I mean, I'm doing pretty good. And then we forget how much grace we need, and then the miracle of grace doesn't really mean as much to us. You know, we kind of lose sight of that. We kind of let it drift, and we kind of just go through the motions. And our faith kind of gets in a little bit of a dead place. I and mean, we, we want to be alive again. It's just like, eh. It's not that I don't want it. It's just that I'm, I'm tired. You know, when life kind of gets in the way, and, and we, we have problems that come around. And it, it's a natural process that comes. And the hardest thing, I think... And you can disagree with me if you want, that's fine. But in my opinion, the hardest thing is to not get prideful. Because once again, yo, I've got my act together. I'm not like these screw-ups out there. <laughs> and uh, I think there's definitely that, that, that danger here. Since it remains for some to enter, and those who formerly received the good news did not enter, you know, let's, let's take some great care here. So uh, back in verse, let's move forward. Uh, there, going back to verse uh, 2, it says, For we also have received the good news just as they did, but the message they heard did not benefit them, since they were not united with those who heard it in faith. Now, once again, I, I talked about this. Faith is, is obeying. Faith is action. Faith is not something primarily that you feel. It's something that you do. Unbelief, on the other hand, now, now this is going to get a little bit confusing, so I'll try to say it as good as I confusedly can. <laughs> Unbelief is caused by disobedience. And unbelief is shown by disobedience. But also the opposite is true. Disobedience is caused by unbelief. And disobedience is shown by unbelief. Both of them kind of interact with each other. And so the question obviously arises, very good question. So which comes first, the chicken or the egg thing, right? Uh, did, did, does disobedience come first, or does unbelief come first? Well, I, I found that it really depends on the person. For some people, they'll be doing good, and then uh, they'll start letting a sin in. And they start getting into disobedience, and it just starts getting worse and worse, and then they get into a place of unbelief. But then I've seen other people uh, who they come to a point in life, they're doing good, they're following God, they're, 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 they're really genuinely saved. They come to a point... Let's say uh, they get cancer. Uh, something drastic like that, where it's like a really big, it shakes them to their core. It has to be something big. It, it never happens with something small. Well, sometimes, but usually it's something really big. So that really big thing happens, and then they start having unbelief instead of disobedience first. 
and as they have unbelief, God's not big enough. God abandoned me. I was faithful. I did all the right things. He just didn't hear. So then they start getting into disobedience because they got unbelief. So which comes first? It depends on the person. It, it, it could really go either way, but they do feed each other. When you don't believe, keep obeying. Keep obeying. When you're struggling in your obedience, keep believing. You just <laughs> got to keep pushing yourself. There, there's, there's, it's going to be a battle sometimes for years, but it's one that you can uh, overcome. Uh, you just have to keep in mind that everybody goes through doubts in their faith. Everybody goes through struggles in their faith. That's normal. It doesn't make you a bad Christian. It makes you not dead. So going on to verse uh, 3, it says, For we who have believed enter the rest, in keeping with what he said, so I swore on my anchor they will not enter my rest, even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. So uh, three quick things, okay? We enter that rest, and I've kind of pointed this out. I just kind of want to make sure we're all on the same page with it. We enter the rest that he's talking about in three ways. The first way, knowing our works don't save us. There is a certain rest that comes when we realize it's by grace alone. There's just a certain, a certain rest that comes with that. And when we try to add our own works, it gets bad. And a lot of times, and I've mentioned this numerous times because I feel like people only really catch what I'm saying about the sixth time that I've said it. When, when you get saved in America, usually what happens is people say, okay, I'm saved by grace. But then they try to earn their place by doing good enough over time. Got to supplement it with works. I've been saved, now I've got to supplement it with works. You see what I mean? And then they get in this place where they, where they don't even realize that they're there, but they're trying to earn their faith, earn their salvation by their works, and they've forgotten about the grace. But the thing is, we aren't just saved by grace, we continue in our salvation by grace. It's never by our works. And so somebody is inevitably going to say, well, yeah, but people eventually have to change how they're living. You're missing the point. You're missing the point. That is something that comes as a result of faith. It's not something that you have to do to get the salvation. And if your first mindset is to always say, well, yeah, but the lifestyle does need to change. You are right. Lifestyle should change. Absolutely. However, <laughs> you can't blind out grace. Grace has to be the top. It has to be right there. You can't, you can't try to keep working around it. There has to be a point where you say, no, 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 no. Saved by grace, continue it by grace. So knowing our works don't save us, that, 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 that is entering rest. But then there's other levels. As a Christian, you can live a miserable life. You don't have to have a wonderful life. In your Christian walk, you do not have to enter his rest. You don't have to wait on God. You don't have to stay in the Word. You don't have to stay in prayer. You don't have to rest in his calm quiet. You don't have to experience the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do any of that stuff. You can go through your life grumbling the whole way. You can do it. I've seen people do it. You can totally have a joyless life. But what's the fun on that? <laughs> the whole point of salvation is that you, you get to experience joy and peace. And you might as well live in it. So, so that's like a second level. The initial, hey, my works don't save me. The deeper level that comes with age in Christ where you're like, okay, uh, I, can, I can walk in, in his rest. But then there's a third level, and that's, that's the obvious one, the end game, if you will, uh, going to heaven. I mean, that's like the ultimate uh, entering his rest. And those three levels, he, he's talking not just about one of them. He's talking with the end game of heaven in mind, but he, he is talking about things here on earth too. If you notice the way that he worded some of these things, we who have believed enter the rest, not will enter. So keeping him, uh, in, uh, in keeping with what he said, so I swore in my anger, they will not enter my rest, even though his works have been finished since the foundation. So he's not just talking about something that's future. He's talking about something that's present and eventually future. So this is one of those themes that I mentioned at the beginning of Hebrews, the already but not yet thing. It's all throughout the book of Hebrews. This is again where it hits us. And the idea is, well, we enter, some to enter, they did not enter. You see the word enter being used in a lot of different uh, tenses. And, um, uh, you know, so you see, you see something that he's not just talking about one point in time. He's talking about a lot of different points in time. And that's a whole already but not yet. We are saved. We're not yet saved. We enter his rest. We haven't entered his rest. Because although we can live this life with joy and peace, it is still this life where we aren't in that final promise, 
So we are going to have things that happen that we're really not big fans of. Really not big fans of. Uh, that's pretty much the idea of, of grief and suffering, or grieving and suffering, uh, that you know we experience in life is because we have not entered the rest. Okay, so moving on from there, <clears throat> he says here in verse 3, uh, so I swore in my anger they will not enter my rest, even though uh, even though his works have been finished since the foundation of the world. What, am I on the right point? Uh, no, I hopped a point. Okay, let's go ahead and do this one since I started it. Even though his works have been finished since the, since the foundation of the world. And that whole idea there that he's saying is the rest has been waiting a long time. That, that's I, 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 I don't really like the way that the CSB words this. Um, I think it's the NLT that words it a lot better. But if you notice, he's talking about, so I swore in my anger they will not enter my rest, even though his works have been finished. You, 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 it's hard to tie the two together. What does his works have to do with, not, you see what I mean? Like, I, I don't get the connection. But I think it's the NLT kind of switches the wording on it, and it, it's not very literal to how the Greek is worded, but I think it gets the point across a little bit better. Let me say it like this. So I swore in my anger they will not enter my rest. And that rest has been waiting for us a long time. So I mean, he's, the emphasis here is on the, the outcome of the works. And so now we can go back to that point that I skipped over. Uh, still in, in verse 3, he says, For we who have believed enter the rest. Um, the idea of you have believed then, you will enter now. Okay, so hold on. What am I trying to say here? Uh, when you are, I mean, where you are and where you are headed today illuminates tomorrow. Look how he says this. We who have believed, we're talking about past, enter the rest, talking about now, in keeping with what he said, so I swore in my ear, they will not enter my rest, future. He's talking about three different points in time. Okay? And so what, what we can deduce from this is that the end game here, uh, or tomorrow is a good way of saying that, is decided by today. Where you are today and where you are headed today, that is going to illuminate your tomorrow. That, that, that we, you can know what, where you're headed tomorrow by how you are responding today. I hope that I said that in a way at least one of those times that was less confusing than the first three times I said it. Because I'm going to move on now and you're just going to have to puzzle out the pieces. Uh, one thing we can definitely tell, though, from Hebrews is that our fruit reveals our heart. Our fruit always reveals our heart. And so if, if you're in a place where you're wondering, what is going on here? Look at your fruit. Look at your fruit. Um, I, I know one of the greatest, one of the greatest uh, warning bells that I get uh, is my children. My children are a direct response to, my, to, to me. See what I mean? They show me my fruit, and I can see where my failings are the greatest by seeing what my children repeat back to me. See what I mean? They, children are basically like little mirrors. And you can see, okay, I'm being impatient. I'm not giving enough time to something, to them, or something else. It, maybe, it's, maybe it's their mother. Uh, I am not uh, paying enough. I'm not being around enough. Whatever. You're going to see little signs. And that's what I'm talking about. Be real with yourself and, lo and look and say, okay, what can I see from this? Because what we do is we get all bent out of shape about something, and then we don't make the change, of course, that's needed. Like we come home after not giving our kids enough time, and then they're acting like terrors, and we say, ah, you're all terrible. Get to your room. And then we go to bed, and we get up early and go to work the next day because that's what's comfortable. It's hard to come home and say, okay, this is showing me that I'm not giving enough time. See what I mean? And so if you'll just be real with yourself, you'll, you'll be surprised that the little, little annoying things that come your way are little reminders of what's going on. Okay? Uh, for those of you who are married, your wife's nagging will be the single greatest gift to you as a husband because that little nagging will get you out of a lot of problems and will help your character to grow. Okay? So don't get too upset because your wife's nagging is typically something that you need to be paying attention to that you're not paying attention to. See what I mean? And now, wives, you're, there's going to be something for you out there, too. I just don't really have that experience because I'm not a woman. But uh, I'm sure that if you pay attention to your own lives, you're going to see little things like that. But in, in the life of a man, I, I know that there are certain little red flags and warnings that I see. And that's what I'm talking about. Pay attention to, your fruit, to the fruit because the fruit reveals the heart. Always pay attention to that. So let's move on from there. 
uh, and we can go to verses 4 through 5, which says this. For somewhere he has spoken about, about the Sabbath. Well, you can't remember a reference, but you know it's in there somewhere. For somewhere in there he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. And on the seventh day, God rests from all his works. That's from Genesis, I think, chapter 2. Uh, and then he goes to, again, in that passage, not that passage, Genesis 2, that passage that I quoted earlier is what he's saying. Uh, they will never enter my rest. Uh, so these are two verses that, 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 that promise God's rest, which is how they tie in to what he's talking about. But let's look to see what they specifically have to say to us. The first verse <clears throat> that he quotes, uh, well, actually, I'll start with the second one. The second verse that he quotes um, Today they will ne- they will never enter my rest is actually from Psalm 95. Now, if you know anything about the Psalms, uh, a lot of them are written by different people, but most of them, except for like I think one, were written after the children of Israel entered the Promised Land. Okay, we're talking about how they did not enter. The rest we're talking about the Israelites didn't enter the Promised Land. They didn't enter the rest because of their disobedience, right? But he recites a verse that was written after they were in the promised land. And so the idea here is that, yes, it was written by David long after the desert wanderings, talking of a future rest. Now, what does it tell us? That tells us that entering the promised land wasn't entering the rest. Let's look at this. He again, from verse 7, he again specifies a certain day today. He specified this speaking through David after such a long time. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. He's talking to an audience that's been in the promised land for a long time. And his point uh, is that the rest has not come. It's still looking forward. So he's not talking about the promised land. He's not talking about priests. He's not talking about law. He's not talking about angels or Moses. He's talking about Christ and what that has come. Uh, and, and obviously w- this is going to have great significance uh, for an Israelite audience. So then the second verse that he brings up that has to do with uh, God's promise of rest is from Genesis chapter 2. And the interesting thing about this is that everybody knows the story of the days of creation. Some people say it's six days, some people call it seven days, it doesn't really matter. All that's important for this is that in those days of creation, the sixth day never ended in the book of Genesis. It never says the, there was evening and there was morning the seventh day. It never says that. Every other day has that formula, except for day seven. And the point that Hebrews is trying to get across is, therefore, the day of rest is still able to us today. It's still accessible to us today. So in the six days of creation, the seventh day never ended. His rest is still ongoing. Let's look at, uh, at uh, verse four. I'm sorry, verse 8. Why do I have that verse there? Oh, because I was going to read it with that one. For if Joshua had given them rest, talking about how Joshua led them into the promised land, God would not have spoken later about another day. So then going to verse 4 now. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works and hopped to, to verse 7. He again specifies a certain day today. The, the time of, of finding God's rest, which is ongoing, is today. It's still accessible to us here. But I do need to clarify a point that's made here in this in this section that he's quoting. It says that he God rested from his excuse me that God rested from his works, not his working. There's a very important distinction to be made. So when it's talking about his works, it's talking about more of the creation event. Okay. It's not talking about his interaction or intervention or anything like that. Uh, and the idea here is that he isn't still creating. So even if you take God out of the, out of the equation, you're talking about in atheistic circles, right? They, they refer to the Big Bang, okay? Then they refer to this period in time, which was much too short for evolution to have taken place, but still, roll with me, pretend like God doesn't exist. They refer to this period in time, and it's called it the Cambrian Explosion, I believe it was called, where all the beginnings of all the life started, and then it stops rather suddenly. This is from an atheist perspective, not from a Christian perspective. That that life ceases suddenly. And so then they say, you know, things evolved, and we supposedly evolved from monkeys. Okay, all right. But the thing is, is that how come monkeys are still here, and how come we haven't evolved into something else? Even if you take a naturalistic position, the point is exactly the th- exactly the same. It has stopped. Either you can say evolution has stopped, 
or you can say the creation has stopped. But it's, it's something that science itself points to and, and agrees. Yes, this is something that has stopped happening. And that's what he's talking about by, his, by saying that God has ceased from his works. That process of creation is, is over and done with. It's not saying that he does not intervene, because obviously he does intervene. Uh, so, from there, I think that's pretty much it. We can summarize all these eight verses by saying his rest is accessible to us. I think that's a pretty good summary. Uh, and he pretty much just quotes those two verses back to back, Psalm 95 and Genesis 2, and just kind of repeats them over and over again, drawing out different points from it. But that's, that's the main idea from it. Next week, we'll pick up in chapter uh, 4, verse uh, 9, I think. Um, okay. So any questions, save them for next week, and uh, we'll go ahead and close out in prayer. Lord, thank you for this uh, time that we have together. Thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you that you are uh, active in your church. You're active through your word. Uh, you're active in our lives. And, uh, Lord, you just, you just never cease to amaze us. Now, we thank you for, for the people who, are, who helped uh, at the event uh, yesterday. And, uh, Lord, I just pray that those, those kids' lives would... Would be would be touched, and that uh, Lord, that some somewhere down the road that uh, they'd be open to the gospel because of little things like this, um, that they they'd remember that there are people who who cared and and who loved, and uh, if that points them to you, then well, okay, that's good enough for us, and uh, Lord, just give us give us patience and courage and wisdom, and we love you, Lord, Amen.